just, just my things are just on okay. Hello everybody, good evening. You're all very welcome here to Hodges Figures and the launch of this wonderful new book, Dear Gay. My name is Vicky Howard, I'm director of Guild Books. I'm so happy to be standing here this evening to mark this publication of this very special book. As you'll hear in due course, and as you'll see when you look through the book yourself, you will see that this book is a handwritten history of Ireland. Letters from ordinary people sharing their hopes and their fears, their joys and their tragedies. Woven together, this remarkable tapestry evokes a time that many here will remember with similar emotions. A time where collectively, layer by layer, letter by letter, we were comforted, we were not alone, we saw and heard ourselves and each other. It's a delight to read from start to finish, and I hope you'll all agree when you have the book in your hands. The road to publication, though, for one reason or another, was at times bumpy. And yet, through every challenge and hiccup, Susie, where is Susie? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you remain so steadfast, so positive, and an absolute joy to work with. I can't tell you how much that's appreciated by all of us at Gill. Because into the world, this book had to come. And I hope you agree that what we have here is now so special and a fitting tribute to the legacy of your dear dad. To everyone at RTE who worked with us on Dear Gay, again, a heartfelt thank you for all your work and understanding. Even in the midst of it, every phone conversation, email or Zoom call was filled with enthusiasm and passion and respect for this project. Thank you. And so here we are. Congratulations, Susie. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> All of us at Gill are extremely proud to publish Dear Gay, and I know it's going to be poured over in many homes this Christmas and beyond. And so now to officially launch the book, I'm delighted to introduce Joe Duffy. Good evening, everybody. I was going to say it's great to see all the old, fa all the familiar faces here. Uh, we all look fantastic. Great, great crowd. Great, great um, uh, attendance. And when you get your hands on the book, you're going to find out why. Not just as a, a testament to Gay, but as a testament to Susie and Ronan and the kids and Nana Kits uh, as well. That's what Kathleen is known as, as you know, in the family. Gay was known as Ra Ra. <laughs> Did he ever believe the Wolf Tones would write a song about it? <laughs> up the ra ra and sing it at the electric at the electric picnic? Um, so to Ronan and Susie, to Cronin and Phil and Kate and Harry, uh, Cronin and Phil's children, uh, Key and Susie and Sai, Gay's beloved, beloved grandchildren. My God, how we loved them! How we love and Anna kids as well. How the two of them loved them and treated them and. Uh, gloried, gloried in their um, in their life and their their loves, and for Crona and Susie, uh, under the enormous uh, wings of Kathleen and uh, the gentle guidance of Gay, um, it's just great, great that this uh, this product here this evening is a product of that whole uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, extended uh, family. Gay, um, as people would attest to, who worked. Uh, we always say we used to work for him. We, we worked with him, but we worked for him. He was a hard taskmaster at times, and he'd come up from the studio uh, every day. He was so, such a man of routine. 10 o'clock, sorry, 10 past 8 every morning, says the papers would finish, and he would walk from the late, late show office over to the radio centre. Exact to the exact second. He'd go straight down to the radio centre, straight down to Studio 7, and set up, put on his green jumper, Kathleen, remember you tried to get rid of it? He had that green jumper <laughs> hidden, hidden, in, hidden in, the, in Studio 7. And then he would begin what some people who were new to the program mistakenly thought was gay praying. Now he did pray, he did go to Mass, he did carry a rosary. Right? It was, he was actually rehearsing. That's what gay he was. And he was rehearsing out loud the letters, the inflections, the pauses, the pacing, he was just a, a consummate problem. Now the other thing as well is, 
no matter what happened in his life or indeed what happened in the world, Gay would not be deflected. And he came in, Kathleen, as you well know, and Maura Connolly knows as well, because she was there. He came in that awful weekend after they discovered that Gay's money had, and Kathleen's money had disappeared. And Gay came in on that Monday morning and he went down to the studio without batting an eyelid, but I was ringing Kathleen all the time and then Maura then came over, so we knew there was something afoot. But he never let a, a, his life in that sense interfere. If Croner or Susie had won the lotto, he wouldn't have said it to us of, of a morning. He would have just gone down. Now I know, Rona, you won the lotto when you met Susie. <laughs> And it was a, it was a seventeen week rollover of the Euro million Jubilee when you met, when you met Susie, um, and he was he was such a professional. Then he would come up at a five past eleven, and he would stand at the entrance to our corral where we all sat. And by the way, those days the corral was just full of smoke, full of the clickety clackety clickety clack of the IBM so called electric typewriters. Um, people be really noisy. Uh, busy, busy place, and he would stand there and he would say, in his beautiful, imperious voice at times, he would say, Who set up the item with the widow? <laughs> and we'd all be shaken. <laughs> and he'd be afraid to say it was you, and then you know, whoever did it would fess up, and then he would say it was either brilliant or brutal. <laughs> but the thing is, he was brutally honest. He was brutally, and he was brutally fair. And then we all went down to the canteen, as you know, Kathleen. Uh, my first job when I arrived there in 1998, uh, 1988, my first job was to get him a cigarette. And he would not buy a cigarette. You know why? He was afraid of his living life. This we told us. He was afraid of his living life of Kathleen Watkins finding an empty box of cigarettes in his in his pocket. So he would say, "Use it to me." This is the time when he could. Will you get me a cigarette? And the match, and the match. <laughs> and um, that was there. And then we'd have twenty minutes, half an hour of just great, great uh, conversation and ideas. Now, Gay, I I sometimes think Gay didn't fully understand the power of the program because one day we had this uh, army chef on, and he was he was there as a guest about being in the Lebanon, but he revealed in the interview that he was a chef in the army, and he, as you know, chefs in the army are the only people trained to kill. And he was, he, was in, he was in the army and was coming up to Christmas and Gay said, have you got tips for Christmas? And he rattled them, he was brilliant, he rattled them off. How to do the turkey, what wine, what not to do with the wine, what time to open them. And by the end of the uh, session, which is about 10 minutes to 11, Gay said, that was absolutely brilliant. Would you, would you write them up and if anyone wants them, would you send in a stamped address envelope? Okay, the next morning, Early post. One bag, two bags, three bags, four bags. The afternoon post. Twelve bags, fourteen bags. We just couldn't move in the office. Gay didn't realise, he didn't realise that the Gay Born radio show on a daily basis, I checked this out once, got more letters than the Queen of England got on a daily basis. The Gay Born radio show, when letters were just, were just so important, and I'll come to that uh, in a second. And... The only, th the only way we could get out of this conundrum was we got two of the newspapers, uh, the Star and the Examiner, to agree to, pub to print the recipes the next day. Gay, in return, would mention them, obviously, and then we sent <coughs> 45 bags of mail that size to the missions. No, no, the missions just to collect the stamps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the missions are still living off them in some, <laughs> some, part, some, some part of the world. Um, and then he got it. When I started in 88, whatever, he start, I was his roving reporter and um he started getting a few letters what does joe duffy look like okay well as you know the face for radio for a start but a gay this gay read out the letter and in this beautiful handwriting which did slow down after that other episode with russell um in his beautiful handwriting he the question was gay joe's about joe I've never heard of joe duffy. What's, what's he look like and gay had written kink brace yourself Think of Brad Pitt. He doesn't look one bit like him. That was one bit. This, 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 the, the, um, 
And the other thing about the radio programme, and the, the radio programme, just like the television programme, just like his family, the backbone were women. Right, gay, gay, loved working with women. They loved working with him. He treated them as equals. They were from, from the get-go, from the get-go. And I just did, and I know I shouldn't because I see John Cadden here, the great John Cadden, I see the great Kieran Fitzgerald, 